Welcome to Cancer Talks, a podcast sharing stories of personal transformation and collective healing from people who have been touched by cancer. My name is Cheryl Buck, and I will be guiding today's conversation. Our guest, Shannon Howard, is a spiritual teacher, life coach, and parenting mentor. She has devoted decades of study to the fields of psychology, philosophy, spirituality, and holistic health. In this conversation, we discuss her mother's cancer journey, the importance of emotional intelligence, and how to become your own healer. Hi, Shannon. Hi, Cheryl. I am so happy to finally be doing this uh, conversation or this interview with you. As you know, we've been friends for a long time. I'm not even going to say how long. <laughs> uh, probably, probably <laughs> that's for the best. And yeah. thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. You know, it's really, it's an honor to be here. I want to ask you some questions about where you came from and uh, some other things about cancer, the, your mother's cancer journey and your own health journey. But before we do that, I just want to say that you have been working on a book about emotional intelligence for a long, long time, several years. Yes. And I thought I knew what emotional intelligence was. I never actually got a definition, or I didn't think I did. But I was reading something about what you do in addition to having written this book called Integral Emotional Intelligence, which we will talk about. On the book, or in the book description, I should say, you wrote a definition of emotional intelligence, and I'd like to read it. Please. So it says, emotional intelligence is the single greatest factor in determining the quality of human relationships. All of life is about relationships, how you relate to yourself, to others, to your work, and to the circumstances of your life. Okay. Everybody needs this. <laughs> right. <laughs> I kind of, you know, I kind of, uh, I had no idea how, it's not complex, but it's it's uh, it's all encompassing. Yes. Yes. So anyway, so I just wanted to read that. So basically the context of this conversation, I think, is emotional intelligence. Tell me if I've got this right, but we're we're coming to this particular conversation that we're having today from that within that context and how important that is to one becoming your own healer which is the title of our conversation today does that sound right to you yeah yes yes that definitely sounds right and you know i just just to say the approach that i take to emotional intelligence is not necessarily the standard approach that's out there in the world when you read about emotional intelligence because I look at emotional intelligence as a window into looking at who we are as human beings, sort of are the totality of us. So it's, uh, I call it integral emotional intelligence because when we raise our emotional intelligence, if we do it in a holistic way, we also are going to raise our physical intelligence, our understanding. It's all connected. It doesn't our emotions don't exist in isolation. We'll talk more about that later. Mm -hmm. But I do think that in looking at emotional intelligence in this sort of more holistic way, we can discover a lot about self-mastery and how to empower ourselves to, you know, create greater well-being in our mm -hmm. lives and greater health. Yes. Greater well-being, greater health, and a greater life. Yes. Okay. Well, let's go back to uh, what I usually ask first. Tell us where you came from. Okay. I, I, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Where'd you come I, I from? Say, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I say it like that. Let's start there. Okay, good. Let's start there. So I grew up in Northern British Columbia in Canada. I just... Uh, been living in the States for several decades. I just got my U.S. citizenship, finally. Yay, yay. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I grew up with a, 
a large family. I've got six siblings and I have, I think we met many decades ago working together at the Hunger Project, but I have always been, you know, sort of interested in new experiences, new opportunities. I've lived in lots of different countries and worked internationally. Um, and, uh, you know, I was thinking about when, when did cancer first touch my life? And it was really when my mother got her cancer diagnosis and she was only 57 uh, and she had ovarian cancer and she was living in Canada on Vancouver Island. I was living in San Francisco at the time. And, you know, it's, it's always shocking when someone, you know, gets a cancer diagnosis. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think when it's apparent for me, it was like, oh, my mother, how, you know, this, you always think of your parents as being infallible in a certain Mm -hmm. way. But she lived with ovarian cancer for seven years. And during that time, I was in San Francisco and in Austin, Texas. And then I was married, had my daughter. We lived in London. Uh, So I wasn't living close to her. And I have to say, I really need to do a shout out to my two sisters because I am so grateful for the fact that they were there with her in the same town and really you know, supported her in a hands-on way. But the thing about her cancer journey, how it was for me, is that it was actually a re- really an opportunity for her and I to become so much closer. And we really got to know each other in a different way, in a much deeper way. And the process for me of her cancer journey was coming to really a profound sense of acceptance about her, about my upbringing, about, you know, just all of it, just my whole experience of her as a parent, you know, coming to a real a place of love and acceptance. And when I was living in, in London, I met a woman named Beata Bishop, which, you know, of her, I, I know. Do. Yes. And she, it's the funniest thing. I mean, she's a, she's a therapist and I actually went to her for an astrology reading. Oh, right. And, and, <laughs> she t- and she told me about her cancer journey and that she had had melanoma and she was diagnosed with a year to live. And of course, this was several years previously, and that she'd written a book about her journey of healing. And so that was my first exposure to the Gerson Clinic. And, you know, and she showed me she had had an operation on her leg where they removed a lot of her calf. And she showed me she was wearing a skirt. And she showed me how (laughs) it how most of that had grown back, which the doctor said was absolutely impossible. You can't grow back muscle tissue. Wow. So I read her book and I was so inspired. And also at the time, I mean, I had been interested in health and nutrition for many, many years and had the opportunity to work with a wonderful nutritionist that you know of in New York named Oz Garcia. Mm -hmm. And he was the first one that introduced me to the idea of individualized medicine or what's known as biochemical individuality, which has really now become the basis of functional medicine. And so, you know, immediately when my mother got her cancer diagnosis, I started talking to her about nutrition and nutritional support. And then I sent her Beata's book and I talked to her about the Gerson Clinic. And she actually did go to the Gerson Clinic for a visit, a short period of time. And it made a huge difference for her. This was in Mexico? Yes. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. So what happened Yes, a few. So she she lived with ovarian cancer for seven years, as I've said, which, you know, is a pretty long time for considering the average. And she said to me, she called me a few months before she passed away. And she said, she just said how much she appreciated all the support I had given her and how Mm -hmm. it really opened her eyes to all kinds of new ideas. And ways of healing. And she was working with a energy healer for a long time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was just doing all kinds of things that she had just not even been part of her frame of reference before getting cancer. So I would say 
in my relationship with her, there was a real healing, you know, it, we just uh, came to such a place of, I think, peace, or at least I did Mm -hmm. (laughs) in our relationship with each other. So that was incredibly valuable. And do I miss her? Yes. I mean, I think about her all, you know, Mm -hmm. frequently like I, you know, I wish I could call my mother right now. <laughs> I don't know, Cheryl. Do we ever get beyond that? I want Probably my not. mother. <laughs> I know. <laughs> exactly. So, um, oh. you know, so that's kind of my my experience with cancer. You know, this topic of becoming becoming your own healer, uh, certainly supporting my mother in this way with, you know, just sort of moral support, information, et cetera. It really has had me start to think about healing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think healing is this concept. We think of people as being healers, like, oh, they're a healer and I'm not like it's a vocation or something. And the more I've done this work with emotional intelligence, the more I've come to realize that actually in a way, all of life is about healing. Mm-hmm. And that everybody, each of us, certainly I have needed to learn how to become my own healer. Um, whether it was perceived wounds from childhood, sort of emotional healing, or physical healing. I've, you know, I know, you know, some of my story, but I, I feel like I've careened through life from a series of health breakdowns, <laughs> you know, where, oh my. you know, yeah. several times in life, you know, I've never received a cancer diagnosis, but several times in life, I have been absolutely flattened health-wise and mm-hmm. have spent very prolonged periods of times, either completely bedridden or just so chronically fatigued, I could barely function. And, you know, it's kind of been for a whole Post every time it's happened, it's been for a different set of reasons, sort of. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like one time I had mercury poisoning, one time I was Hashimoto's thyroiditis from pregnancy, Uh, another time it was Epstein Barr, you know, autoimmune stuff. It just sort of uh, goes on and on. But yeah, but every time I've had to go through the uh you know, the disorientation, the alienation, the isolation, the hopelessness, the fear, the sort of depression, Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and just the absolute lack of energy. And I've had to kind of dig myself back up out of that hole, you know, to try and recapture some sense of vitality and aliveness and joy. And you do say, uh, one of the things I think is so great that you say is that it's never just physical. So you had all those physical issues. And at what point did you realize this is not just physical? You know, other aspects to it. I think, I think probably the very first time I was in my senior year of high school and I got mono quite Mm -hmm. badly. And I actually was so sick. I missed a couple months of school in my senior year. And Mm -hmm which was pretty devastating. But it, I knew also at the same time, I knew I was in a whole existential crisis, wondering what am I going to do with my life? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and like just being in the face of that, which mm-hmm. I think, you know, it's like a classic teenager thing is, you know, what am how am I going to do this? And you know, at the time I was having a very difficult relationship with my mother. I actually moved out when I was 16, moved out of my home. So I was really, there was a lot going on emotionally. And so I think even then I knew that it was more than just the fifth. I I had a suspicion, even at the age of 17, that my illness wasn't just an illness. It was a manifestation of what was going on in my life. And that has just happened over and over again. Every time I've had one of these physical breakdowns, as I said, for a a whole variety of reasons, every single time it's been along with a major breakdown in my life where there is a major transition or a major loss or, 
you know, a massive amount of stress. So Mm -hmm. it's funny. It's like the, in, in hindsight, I can see for me that these times when I've been kind of flattened in a way has forced me to reevaluate my life and look at everything Mm -hmm. in my life, everything from who am I? What's my purpose? What am I up to? You know, to what am I feeling? Who am I mad at? How do I get Mm -hmm. out of this, these feelings of self pity? How do I deal with this fear that, you know, I'm never going to be functional again. So it's really been the whole enchilada. And I kind of feel like every single time I felt like, you know, there's a, when I lived in London, you get on the subway, you hear this announcement, this woman in a lovely British accent, she says, mind the gap (laughs) as you're getting on the train. (laughs) And every time I've been confronted with one of these major health challenges, I keep thinking, you know, mind the gap. It's like feeling like it pushes me back right up against the confront of like the void, like kind of like that, you know, the emptiness of life. like, what is this? What, what's going on? What, you know, it's like that nothingness. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Does this yeah. make any sense? Uh, yeah, it does make sense. And would you say that you felt like a victim? Oh, absolutely. Uh-huh. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's like, I, I think a lot of my work with people with emotional intelligence is, you know, it's really the lessons that I've learned about how to recover my sense of equilibrium. Mm -hmm. You know, I really think of resilience as our ability. It's how quickly we can come back to recapture our sense of equilibrium and our, you know, sense of our calm centered self. Mm -hmm. And when we're challenge, at least certainly for me, when, when a huge challenge comes up in life or like a health breakdown, I think it's impossible not to feel completely at the effect of it, (laughs) you know, because it just, it disorders all your priorities in life. Mm -hmm. And, and even with a health breakdown, you are alienated from other people. If you don't have the energy to call people or go out or do things, you know, it's, it's alienating, it's disorienting, it's disorder, it disorders your life. And there's that sense of feeling like a failure, mm-hmm. you know, like I, I, there's some, I've done something wrong. There's something wrong about me, you know, and that leads to feelings of self-pity, of fear, right. you know, maybe anger, certainly helplessness, hopelessness. I have had many times in life where I have wallowed in self-pity, believe me, mm-hmm. <laughs> and depression <laughs> and depression. I mean, that's all part of digging yourself back out of the hole. But certainly one thing I've learned in life is that being emotionally intelligent does not mean you're not going to be challenged in life or you're not going to get upset or reactivated or triggered. It doesn't mean that. It just means how how are you going to recover your sense of self and your equilibrium and your sense of personal power and your agency? Um, You know, how how are you going to handle the challenge? How are you going to approach it? Mm -hmm. Um, That's where the emotional intelligence comes in. Mm -hmm. Perhaps how to uh, shift from being a victim to being the author. Yes. Of your own life, of your own story. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, you know, I, I've learned a lot about taking back my power and sense of agency in the mm-hmm. face of breakdowns because I've had to navigate through so many. Right. Um, right. You know, I had a, a spiritual teacher told me once that when we're in the process of learning how to heal, we create lots of breakdowns. So that we can oh, great. <laughs> learn how to do it, right? <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. that's what I said to her. I said to her, oh, yeah, thanks. Thanks a bunch. <laughs> um, but I do think, you know, I, I think that there are, in a way, yes, we, we are victimized by illness. Certainly, there's that sense of being victimized. And, you know, there are absolutely external forms of victimization, mm-hmm. you know, anytime we have a fundamental need that gets violated 
you know, then we feel victimized. It's, it's you know, can be quite abusive. And mm-hmm. that is a real thing. But there's this other thing, which is more of a victim mindset. And self-pity is really one of the biggest expressions of mm-hmm. that. And, you know, or being a martyr or feeling done to or somebody's out to get us or helpless and hopeless, you know, it's, so then it's how do we not stay stuck in that place? Because it's very much a downward spiral. Right, exactly. You know, so how do we shift? How do we shift out of it? Um, Mm -hmm. So for me, it certainly has been discovering and cultivating my inner sense of being and Mm self-worth. And I use this what I call a cognitive map, but it's a a model for the map of our, the human psyche, how consciousness moves through us. And it does it in three ways, you know, through our conscious self, our super conscious or higher self and our subconscious self. And a lot of what I do is, is help people, empower people to get reconnected with their sense of self. Mm -hmm. And that is the, you know, it's our inner being. It's the being part of human being. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, right. and so for me, that is the reconnecting with the part of that self in me has been how I've been able to shift out of being in self-pity mm-hmm. and being in victim mode. Um, right. You right. know. Well, how do you how do you do that? What's well, your secret? I, Well, my secret, (laughs) there's lots of ways to do that. So how do you cultivate your sense of self, your true Mm -hmm. self? You know, Mm -hmm. that's not, this is not like your identity. It's not even your story. It's not Mm -hmm. what you own. It's nothing external. It's who you are as a conscious being. It's that inner spark of life. It's the, I think of, I think of the conscious self is that it's, the part of us that's always listening to our thoughts. It's mm-hmm. the, you know, the part of us who is the, oh, that poor self. Oh, that poor, <laughs> that poor part. Oh, woe is me, right? Exactly. <laughs> in in Buddhism, they call it developing mental discipline. When you you're not just you're buying into every random thought that goes yes. through your head. Like you're the Please. you are you're the space and you're the listener, the one mm-hmm. who's listening. You're the witness of your life and your, our consciousness, you know, I tell myself, so I have lots of little practices. I do. I have lots of little phrases I do that help me come back to this place. And Mm -hmm. they're phrases like, you know, if when I, when I start to feel really at the effect of a circumstance or someone in a negative way, I have to tell my, I remind myself, okay, this thing, whatever it is, is not bigger than me. I do Mm -hmm. not exist in its space. Mm. It is actually existing in my space. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) You know, and then if I notice like that voice of the inner critic coming up, that sort of self negating, oh, I'm so stupid, I'm a failure. How did this happen again? You know, that sort of way that we beat ourselves up. Yeah. Uh, What's wrong with me? (laughs) What's wrong with me? You know, when I notice that voice, that voice of our inner critic, which I also think is the voice of our negative ego, I remind myself, okay, that's just the voice of my inner critic. That's one of many voices in my head in all, you know, we all have many voices in our heads. Right. (laughs) And I make a choice not to give that voice power. Yeah. You know, I just observe those thought, thoughts and it's like, okay, I got it. Like, and I'll go like, wow, my, my inner critic is really strong today, <laughs> but I am not going to buy into it because I know it's not the truth. Yeah. And so I remind myself, I am not my thoughts. Yeah. I am the being that is the space for these thoughts. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I'm not my emotions. I have my emotions, but mm-hmm. who I am as my true self is not my emotions. It's much bigger than my emotions. So, Mm -hmm. 
So I have little ways that I remind myself and that's part, you know, mindfulness is a huge piece of this. Mindfulness for me is, is a really great tool to have us be present. And when we're really present, we are in our conscious self. You know, we're just being present with what's mm-hmm. occurring. Mm-hmm. And so I think mindfulness is a great way. Obviously, meditation is a great way. And, you know, I've never been one of those people, you know, part of my inner critic says, oh, I'm, you're not, you're just not very disciplined. <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, so I've never been able to have, I've never ever in life had like a Oh, meditate everyday practice, but I do meditate and I meditate in spurts. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, I'll go for a few months and I'll meditate every day or I'll meditate five times a week. And then I'll go for a period of time, you know, a month or two go by and I'll go like, oh, I really, I should meditate again. So (laughs) then I feel called, called to meditate and then I do. So Mm -hmm. I don't let, you know, I've no, I no longer beat myself up for not being a consistent meditator. Yes. I, I meditate when I feel it's a useful tool. And, yeah. you know, I really, I spend a lot of time with people working with them to encourage them and help them discover their practices. Like for you, Cheryl, your, whatever practices that work for you to remind you of who you really are mm-hmm. is they're going to be, maybe some of them will be the same, but, you know, I don't like to give people a blueprint. I like to give them choices or kind of point them in the direction because every single human being is so unique. And that's the thing about crafting a a health, a successful healing journey is every person's healing journey is going to be unique because we're all in different places and we all have different frames of reference. And it's just like cars share a certain basic set of operating principles. There are many varieties, you know, Um, and we, we all share a certain inner design called our psyche, which is the same for every human being. We are all a spark of consciousness that is expressed through a physical body. Mm-hmm. But every person is in, is as individual as the, you know, almost 8 billion thumbprints in the world. And so the thing about finding your practices are they have to be what feels like an opening for you. Mm-hmm. You know, so your reminders have to work for you. Anyway, but so those are those are just some of the things I do. But I'll tell you one of the most important things, though for shifting out of that, for me, shifting out of that victim mentality Uh is finding some way to take responsibility for Uh what's occurring. (laughs) No, (laughs) you know, (laughs) it's like, because being a victim, when we stay stuck in that mindset, it's a way to avoid responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the conscious self, the, the kind of main qualities of our conscious self or this inner being is responsibility, respect, and love, being loving and receiving love. And Mm -hmm. when we can, certainly when I can find something I can take responsibility for, you know, sometimes, sometimes it can just be the fact that this breakdown has shown up in my life. So Mm -hmm. uh, ergo, I must be responsible in some way, not like not at fault, not to blame, but more like, you know, well, I, I somehow I put my, you know, I got myself here to this place in time. So I have, you know, I can own that, you know, so, so so that for me is always the first step out of self-pity is to find something that I can own that I can be responsible for. Maybe Mm -hmm. I can take responsibility for how I'm feeling or something, anything, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, sometimes it feels like grasping at straws, but that that's the first step back to taking back our power. I think in any situation. So, yes. Okay. So now this brings us to the purpose of life. You didn't know (laughs) Uh, (laughs) the uh, audience uh, didn't know that (laughs) they're going to get the purpose of life in this, in our conversation. (laughs) And, you know, you told a story about a yogi who, um, 
that yeah. um, everything that happens, he that the yogi believes that everything that happens is a possibility to grow and evolve. Yes. And and that's what you're really referring to, you know, when yeah. you talk about taking responsibility and for what, what occurs in your life. So will you please tell us what the purpose of life is? <laughs> yes, I've, I I've alluded to it. <laughs> Well, and, and let's relate that to a healing journey. So, okay, very good. so what makes a successful healing journey? That's a, that's a question I've been inquiring into for decades. So the purpose of life is near as I can figure it out. I'm always happy to upgrade my beliefs. If anyone has a better interpretation, I would love okay. to know. We'll, we'll, we'll get back um, to you on that. Okay. But, you know, the purpose of, of life is to grow and evolve and become more conscious. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of it. And uh, as near as I can figure, and I've like studied spirituality for decades and psychology and you name it. And at least this is where I've landed. So mm -hmm. to grow and evolve, particularly to evolve in our consciousness and to discover, you know, is to discover more and more, to become more self-aware, to become more awake to become mm -hmm. more present. And so that's, if that's the whole purpose of life, then mm -hmm. how do we define what is a successful healing journey? And mm -hmm. I think one of the first things we have to, to think about is that dying is not a failure. We are all going to die. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, news alert. Um, here, here, surprise, <laughs> you know, news flash, right? Yes, yes. And so we're all going to die. And if death is a failure, which in our Western culture, it very much is, I think, held a lot in that context. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't my experience of when I lived and worked in India, but uh, it is, it certainly is here in the West. And mm -hmm. so, you know, when we're, when we buy into that conversation or mindset, uh, mm -hmm. we've set ourselves up for failure already because, exactly. you know, we're, we're all going to fail. We're yeah. all, we're all going to fail, you know, and I, I, I've had lots of different spiritual teachers have said things to me about dying. And it's something of, I, I, I do think that one of the most important things we can do in any journey of life and healing journey is to make peace with and come to terms with our own mortality. Yes. Because I think that that is the biggest thing that has us be fear driven in mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And when we can really be present to that and get come to a place of peace however we do that like mm -hmm. you know it's different for different people obviously but I think that that we can unwire a lot of our unconscious fear-driven behaviors by making peace with our mortality so I don't define now obviously you know if you if we get a cancer diagnosis or some other health breakdown of course we want to heal we want to you know live and have a long, wonderful life. But, but for me, dying is not part of the equation because inevitably it's going to happen. For me, the question is, who are we being in the face of whatever's occurring in whatever time we have? Because no, none of us ultimately know how long mm -hmm. we're going to have, obviously. How are we experiencing life? How are we approaching our life? And, mm -hmm. and if the purpose of life is to grow and evolve and become more conscious, then how is how can we use this horrible circumstance that's happened in our lives? It can be so devastating, but how can we use it to find a way to grow and evolve so that we are actually fulfilling our life's purpose Mm -hmm. through the process of this difficult journey. Mm -hmm. And the saying was that the saying of what is a spiritual or a yogic approach to life, and I think Sadhguru said this, was that um, you can't, it can be summed up in, the, in this saying, you can't do anything bad to a yogi because everything that happens to a yogi occurs as a possibility. So I remind myself of that phrase, all the time. That's mm -hmm. what that's also one of my practices I use to get out of feeling in self-pity or being a victim. 
Yes. Um, you know, and, and I think that's a pretty high level. You know, I, I asked myself, well, okay, but what about if that happened? <laughs> Would right. that be an opportunity? <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, you know, and I think I think for me, part of what goes with that saying is also the understanding of, you know, there's another phrase that we bandy about that's, oh, everything happens for a good reason. And I don't know. I mean, in my experience, I don't think that everything happens for a good reason. And I don't think people, oh, they were just doing the best they could. I don't think people always do the best they can. I don't certainly know I haven't in life. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do think that what we can do is when, when we bring our best self to a situation, when we actually know how to access our best self, our personal highest ground, that inner being our conscious self, when we bring our best self to a situation, we can have it be for the best because Mm -hmm. we're, we're bringing our creativity, our thoughtfulness, our consciousness, our love, our compassion. You know, Mm -hmm. when we bring those things to a breakdown, we can cause a breakthrough. We can have it be transformational. And I do think that for me, a healing journey, uh, we've said a few things about it, but it's also the same way I look at emotional intelligence is that for me, taking a holistic approach to creating a healing journey, my own healing journey has been including what I call the four areas of human expression, which everyone has heard many times, which is mind, body, spirit, and emotions. Those are Mm -hmm. Those are the four domains that we have to express consciousness or to express ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're going to do it in one. And, you know, we've lived in this very separatist sort of mindset that our emotions are separate from our thoughts, which are separate from our body, you know, and I take what is called a whole systems approach. I don't think any of that is separate. I think Mm -hmm. that nothing exists in isolation. When we have an emotion, we have a set of thoughts that go with that emotion. Those thoughts can cause that emotion. Maybe the emotion causes the thoughts. Sometimes, you know, there's also we have for every emotion, we have a set of physical sensations, you know, and for every emotion we have, there's a greater purpose, there's meaning, there's value that we can create out of it. There's, you know, we can imbue it with something higher. There's our sense of intuition and how we listen to our higher self. So what I have learned in life in my own healing journey, and when I've looked at all my health breakdowns, is that nothing has occurred in isolation, you know, and that every time, every time I have a thought about something, uh, there's an emotion, there's a physical feeling, and there's a purpose. So for me, that that's taking a holistic approach. And I think when we do that, our odds of having a successful healing journey, and becoming our own healer, it's enhanced, it's increased. Yes, that's that's great. So when you when you talk about or when we talk about becoming our own healer, just say a little bit more about that. Just kind of can you just sum that up? Yeah. What the point is about that? Yes. <laughs> what my point is. <laughs> well, you know, I think so if I was to sum it up, I would say I think that each of us all of life is is about learning to heal. And, you know, we each need to discover how to heal ourselves because no one else honestly can do that work for us. Mm -hmm. And we all know our health and how we approach life is the container. It's the context in which all of life occurs. But I do think there's some elements of healing that are really important. And one is that as far as I can tell, all healing happens, occurs as a function of love, mm-hmm. that in any way, shape, or form, anyone who gets into one of the, you know, quote unquote, helping professions, it's an expression of love. Anytime we work on healing ourselves, it's an expression of self love, that mm-hmm. it's absolutely a prerequisite. And that also healing requires will, it requires first a willingness. So Mm -hmm. having will, like a willingness to be healed in any of these domains, four domains. And 
And then also a commitment that I am going to create healing here. I am going to experience feeling more whole. I'm going to experience having greater integrity. I'm, I'm going to somehow experience greater well-being. And so those are all really critical pieces of healing, mm-hmm. I think. And what about accepting the situation that you're in? Yes. Yeah. So I think self, self-love self and self-acceptance and even what I call radical acceptance are also really essential because we can't heal what we don't accept Mm -hmm. you know we have to really have to be present with what is what is what is so yeah and you know the self-love part I think just to say one last thing about it is a lot of my journey has been getting free of this trance of lack of self-worth Mm-hmm. and feeling unworthy. Yes. You know, and I think it's something again it's it's very prevalent in our culture, but I've come to realize and this is something I tell myself over and over again um is that who we are inside is worthy that the only prerequisite to self-worth is existence. Mm-hmm. And if if you're alive, you're worthy. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> sort of end of story, you know, that we're all the the being that animates our physical body, this conscious awareness, this spark of life. This is the same. It's the same consciousness. It's the same spark of life that animates every human being. No one is more worthy or less worthy than anyone else. And the lie of unworthiness is something we bought into a long time ago, usually when we were really small and we did something wrong and we felt ashamed and there was something wrong with us, you know, we sort of bought into this lie, but it is a lie. And so I think the absolute core for me of creating a successful healing journey is discovering my own inner self-worth. Yes. I think this is bears repeating as we're winding down here, that you, me, everyone is worthy just by being human. I mean, if we could get that, our lives would transform. I mean, our lives would transform. <laughs> the world would transform. Yes. I yes. Mean, that's it, yes. Yeah. And it's not, it just pops up all the time, you know, that like I'm not worthy or I screwed up there or whatever. So it's going to take something to do that. But I think just having you talk about that a little bit and just bring that up as a possibility, (laughs) that may may be all we can do at first. That might be all we can do. (laughs) There is a lot more we could say about that and how, you know, it's this trance of unworthiness. It's it's at the base of a lot of what's going on in the world is, uh, you know, there's denigration. Someone Mm -hmm. is someone is put above someone else you know Mm -hmm. man is above nature you know we just we we don't revere and respect life in in the way that we need to to heal ourselves to heal our relationship with the world to heal our relationship with one another If you enjoyed this conversation, please leave a review in your podcast app. Cancer Talks is a platform for anyone who has been touched by cancer. Write to us at info at cancertalks.com if you have a story to share. If you'd like to be in community with other cancer thrivers seeking personal transformation, join us for free workshops on Zoom. Visit cancertalks.com slash Zoom to register. If you're moved to donate, please visit cancertalks.com slash donate.